Hey, welcome to another episode of Your Faith and Health Community. I'm your host, Pastor Jackie Jackson. And as always, on behalf of myself and our producer, Anita Alexander, we want to thank you for taking out time from your busy day to spend with us. Hopefully, prayerfully, we'll share some information with you that will improve your quality of life. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time, so I'm just going to make this real quick. One, if you were not insured with health insurance by the, from the last time we talked, I hope you've done it by now. And if you haven't, I hope you'll do it within the next week. I want to send out prayers and love for the people of Ukraine who are dealing with just, just atrocities. Um, just hearing today that there was a missile that struck a train station and it killed 50, at least for now, some children and many more wounded. So we definitely, like I said, we want to send out love. We want to send out prayers, um, send out our thoughts. But also, we want to make sure anything we can do to help, let's do that to help. Um, also want to send out prayers for the families in Sacramento um, and Dallas over the weekend or last week with the mass shootings there, um, as well as close to home over in Covington, Kentucky, for the young people who were shot this past weekend um, we want to make, definitely make sure we send out prayers for them. But while sending out thoughts and prayers, we also need to do something. We need to put our thoughts and prayers into action. The Bible says that faith without works is dead or faith without works is useless. So you can sit back and go, hey, I'm sending you prayers. But it's like I said, if a person is hungry and you say, I'm praying for you, go and be fed, that's not going to feed anybody. So do the action. Give them something to eat. Let's get involved with this gun violence. Don't wait. Please don't wait until it's at your door to decide you need to do something. Because then, unfortunately, for you or your loved one at that particular time, it's too late. So let's do that. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to get off my soapbox early. I know you're going, God, thank goodness, because this man can go. Okay, I'm done. I'm going to leave you alone. Get the health insurance. Get your health insurance, okay? Thank you. Listen, we have two great guests here. One, we had um, just recently attorney Glenda Smith. She um, was on the show last time. If you saw it, it was very phenomenal, the work that she talked about. But I want to just, I want to read her, a little bit of her bio. So you, if it's your first time, you will understand who she is. And if it's your second time, just to refresh your memory, just how awesome this young lady is. So Glenda Smith, or attorney Glenda Smith, is recognized in 2020 as one of the nation's top, top 100 black lawyers by the National Black Lawyers Association. She does teach a continuing education, I'm sorry about that, a continuing legal education course on juvenile justice reform and juvenile violence. And if you're keeping up with what's going on, not only in the city of Cincinnati, but across the country, there are more juveniles being shot and unfortunately more juveniles actually being the perpetrator in gun violence and a number of different violences. Just watched on, on television recently about a school where the, the a Christian school and the basketball players attacked these youth and their parents attacked a referee put him in the hospital. I think he got 30 stitches. It's just crazy what's going on. So we've got to do something around our youth. And that is one of the things that attorney Glenda Smith is doing. She has a heart and a passion. And listen, that means that there's an anointing on her to do the work that she does. It's not that she just woke up one day and thought it. It was something that was imparted in her long before she knew it was even going to be activated. But I'll get back because, you know, I can go off, off script a little bit, right? So um, Attorney Glenda Smith has over 20 years of experience fighting for justice for marginalized people and juvenile as well as domestic re relations in Indiana and Ohio Court of Appeals and federal court. So, you know, this, this young lady has, has got some stuff for us. Now, to her young get, our young guest with us, I'm really excited about this young man. Had an opportunity to talk to him a little bit. His name is Guhan Krishnan. I said it right? Yep. I said it right. All right. This young man is, all I can say is, after I came in and met him, he's very impressive, and he's young. And, you know, people like myself, 
people like Attorney um, Smith, it's important for us to do the work, you know, but me being a millennial, it's a little bit different than um, this young man coming in. So let me just tell you a little, about, a little bit about this young man. I want to start with the type of leadership position that he is in. He is the Hamilton County Youth Court Jury Captain. Jury Captain. I've never even been on a jury. This young man is the jury captain. He is also National Honor Society co-chair. So that means you already know that this young man is putting in the time in the books and you've got to applaud his family, his parents for being there for him and stressing the importance of education. So I applaud that. I want to read just a little bit more. I want to read you his GPA. Kind of matches mine a little bit if you subtract a whole bunch. Um, his GPA is four Point thirty four. That's that's impressive. That's impressive, young man. Um, just a little bit more. I want to talk about him. He his college courses, college level courses, psychology, language and composition, U.S. history, chemistry, microeconomics, federal government, and this young man is the intern with Dr. Glenn. I mean, I didn't call her a doctor. Attorney, that must be her next move, with attorney Glenda Smith. So I want to thank you both, welcome you for being on the show. It's an honor to sit here across from the table and talk with you. Thank you, uh, Pastor Jackson. Um, you are correct. I do have a doctorate in jurisprudence. I am just typically do not pr refer to myself as a doctor. But um, Guhan uh, reached out to me and in an email and said, look, I researched you, but I'll let him tell you in his own words. And I was so impressed with him. I was like, he, he said, I want to intern with you. And I absolutely, after talking to him, looking at his resume, um, it was just wonderful. But the thing is, he also has an anointing. So I'll let you. Uh, I want to just stop for one second before we jump over. I just want to um, go back a little bit before, because I, we're definitely going to talk to this young man and talk okay. about him. But I just want to go back. We were talking about um, the situation with detention in, in mm -hmm. the juvenile system. And I think that's important. And we really make a great segue to the work that this young man is doing mm -hmm. down in the juvenile court, mm -hmm. um, working with that. So can we go back just, just, yes. to, just to touch people's yes. mind on that again? First of all, um, we, sh we know, because it's a statistics, that we should never put a child in detention unless it's absolutely necessary. And when I'm talking about detention, I'm talking about jail, Pastor Jackson, not detention at a high school. Um, and because we know that children who are detained just one time will commit another crime. Uh, they have like a... Uh, 50% chance, a high chance of committing another crime within two years, and a 70% chance by age 21. So the reforms that the rest of the nation and other counties in Ohio um, have made uh, reduce detention. And so that uh, is how we decrease violence, juvenile violence. Okay, and, and, and I think that that information again and, and thanks for clearing it because I know the last show we talked about it and I was thinking it was detention in school mm -hmm. and and then we got to the point that it was detention or or as jail I mean at the end of the day right mm -hmm. detention sounds really nice but but putting yeah. these young people in jail mm -hmm. is what it boils down to and um, there was another figure you mentioned that I thought was really high and it was dealing with Ohio and now I had it in my head and now I can't remember. So if I think about it, we'll, we'll come back, swing back around to it, because that I remember that was one of the things that I was shocked. Was it bind over? Maybe that was it. Okay, so we know that bind over, uh, mandatory bind over is when a child commits certain offenses uh, and probable cause is found, they're automatically tried in adult court. We know that that is also a mistake because children who are tried in an adult court uh, have an increase of 38% of committing another offense 
than children who have committed similar offenses but are tried in juvenile court or stay in juvenile court. So uh, again, the rest of the country um, has abolished mandatory bind over, um, including our neighbor, Kentucky. So there is a bill in the House, Ohio House legislature, um, House Bill 500 to abolish um, bind over, mandatory bind over. And I've been soliciting support for that. I've been lobbying to, to pass that bill. Um, so, it's, so it's mandatory bind over. Um, but I'm, I'm curious just, just to see where you stand on this. Do you think that there are some situations where a young person may need to be bound over? Actually, I think it could all be handled in juvenile court. However, at this point, the way things stand today, uh, there are rare circumstances, very rare, um, where a child will need to be or should probably should be, um, you know, tried in adult court. But my mindset is we are juvenile court. A juvenile court is not a criminal court. It is a civil court. We are to uh, implement corrective measures, not punitive measures. But let me ask a question, though. If, if that young person is in juvenile court for murder, mm -hmm. um, rather it, rather it's an individual, mm -hmm. rather it's a mass shooting, mm -hmm. but something to that degree, mm -hmm. that but wouldn't that be a little bit more than corrective? I understand the part of correctiveness mm -hmm. going through, but if you have a person, and I don't mean a, a kid who finds mom or dad's weapon, they're playing with it and it goes off. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think you need to okay. bound that kid over. Good. But if you take, oh no, I mean, because, because Good. That's, that's unintentional <laughs> shooting. And right. I mean, come right. on, that could happen with somebody cleaning their weapon. It mm -hmm. shouldn't, you should know mm -hmm. what you're doing. But there was no intent. Right. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about a young person who purposely takes a weapon, I remember I was in a meeting with the chief and a couple other people. I mean, a couple other officers. And, and it was a big actually, a couple of people. It was a whole bunch of people. It was a, a community meeting. And they talked about having pulled over two 15 year olds with a cachet of guns, mm -hmm. weapons mm -hmm. in their trunk. You've got an intent for these weapons. So when you have a kid who may go out and purposely shoot and kill someone, do you think, and, 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 I, and I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, actually, yes, I do. Do you think <laughs> that they should not be bound over to adult court and they should be dealt with? Because I never, you just educated me. I didn't know juvenile court was considered civil court. Yes, it is. Okay, so that's education for me. Mm -hmm. um, I can't answer the question as you presented it. I would have to see an actual case, case and look case. at the facts of that case. I will tell you the reforms that are in place now are data driven and there are, um, there's different mod modalities that are used to figure out where a child is at when they're brought in or, or have interaction with juvenile court. And those modalities tell us where, what best to do, what resources are, are should be used to help this child, um, to help correct this child. Um, what, you, what you're describing to me, there are so many different uh, uh, things that can occur in that scenario. There are so many different scenarios that could be involved with that child being involved in a mass shooting or shooting an individual. There is a child that does something, there's something more to it than just that day. Like you said about me, um, that this anointing didn't occur, you know, over, but, but it, you it's could been also there. Say that, you could also say there's more to it for an adult that goes out and shoots someone. It's, it's usually, it's also that thing that there oh, may absolutely. be a chain of events, but then sometimes, Sometimes it's because you stepped on my sneakers. Mm -hmm. And so because you stepped, on, you stepped on my sneakers or you said something I didn't like or you like the girl that I like, I'm going to kill you. 
And mm -hmm. so that, and I understand what you're saying. I like the fact, and that's honest, that it's a case by case. Mm -hmm. I just kind of wanted to get that out there. Mm -hmm. Just put that out there, because that, mm -hmm. that's, I've, I wrestled with that as well. It's like, you know, should this young person be turned over? But considering the fact of the number of people that I've had murdered in my family, and, um, and, and some have been by young people, mm -hmm. my mentality goes, if you are willing to pick up a weapon and murder someone, that I kind of feel like, yeah, you need to you need to face more serious consequences because if you face something that can sometimes amount to a slap on the wrist, then you're more amped to go back and do it again. But I think this is a good thing to bring in this young man because you're working yeah. in the system uh -huh. and you being a jury captain, I'm going to assume that means that you um, you you set and heard. Mm -hmm. A lot of things, yeah. a lot of stuff. So let, let's bring you in. I want to bring you in first on, if I may, on the question that I just asked yeah, Attorney right. Smith. So I think the one takeaway I've had from my three years as in Hamilton County Youth Court, and obviously I can't talk about these um, harsher crimes like murder because you know these are first-time mm -hmm. juvenile offenders. But the one thing I noticed is the difference between someone on this side of the court case as like a juror versus the other side as the person committing the crime is really little to none. Because many times I've heard court cases where we didn't even know that what they were doing was even a crime. Something as simple as like curfew, I've seen a jaywalking arrest and things like that. So obviously for these murder cases, um, the question of bind over is a bit more nuanced. But in the majority of these cases, which are you know minor offenses for something like bind over to be applied, I think it's pretty ridiculous. Okay, you said jaywalking. Yeah. I didn't know people got arrested for jaywalking. Neither did we, but that's what happens. Okay, can I, I'm not asking you to talk about a specific case, right. but because to me that is just out, that is outrageous that someone was arrested for mm -hmm. jaywalking. I mean, it seems that there would have to be a whole. They yeah. jaywalked and they picked up a car. I don't know. It, there's got to be I think, more. I think I'm sure there was some circumstances, but at the heart of the case, there wasn't a crime committed that wasn't. Jaywalking. Wow. Pastor Jackson, that goes along with the reforms that are taking place. First, as a juvenile court judge, I have to go in and convince the Cincinnati Police Department, really, uh, we need to change our mindset. I have to convince other stakeholders. Uh, you now uh, probation, we have to change our mindset. And that's going to take a little bit of time. Magist juvenile magistrates, we're going to have to change our mindset. Um, because th this should not be happening, right? And you got to change mindset because, <laughs> because as bad as this is, but we know that it's true around the country, mm -hmm. it's, also, it's also a revenue maker. Mm -hmm. um, bringing mm -hmm. kids into jail, just like adults mm -hmm. put it, you know, mm -hmm. that I don't remember what it, I don't know what it is now, but I know at one point I think the state got $35,000 for every person who got a mm -hmm. number. So I'm going to assume that when a, a juvenile is locked up, that there's something, I remember a long time ago, in fact, um, a good friend who is like family, um, I still call her Judge Tracy Hunter, I, I mm -hmm. think that there was a bad deal going there for her, but um, I remember before, long before she got and even running for judge was a part of helping expose, I, I think it was a, a juvenile court judge who actually owned land or something mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. where right. how do you own the land or the building where people, where you are mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. sending people? So you're right mm -hmm. about the reform and, and, and changing the mindset of, of the prosecutors, the police mm -hmm. department, mm -hmm. the public, Correct. right, and all Correct. of that. And, and, and but also in changing that mindset, somehow we've got to get money where it, it's, it can, it, the profitability of locking someone up, whether a juvenile or adult. I think when there's profit in doing it, you're going to find people more willing and quicker to lock people up or to arrest somebody for jaywalking. I don't, I don't know what the benefit of that is other than it being, to me, outrageous. So I'm sorry. I also want to point out is that uh, Wyoming, which is where we live, mm -hmm. you and I, they will never 
arrest a child in Wyoming for jaywalking. They will never do that in Mason. They will never do that in Sycamore. They will never do that in Indian Hill. The place that you will find that typically is in Cincinnati um, and maybe a few other places. Um, because we know, now this is in black and white, this is historic, we know that police police the poor, pacify the middle class, and cater to the rich. We know that. They do that in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, there may not be poor as you know it in Wyoming, but there's black people there, and we know that this goes on everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I've been... People see the color of your skin, and you can get stopped because of the color of your skin. People, you know, police officers will make up an excuse to, to stop you. Now, I, I want to say very quickly that I am a strong supporter of law enforcement, but there are a few bad apples, and I get to see those bad apples because I am a civil rights attorney. Mm -hmm. um, so they are out there, and you know, a couple bad apples ruin the whole bunch. And the thing with the police department is they cannot police themselves. They cannot. It is very dangerous to have another police officer tell on another police officer. Right. Well, I can't, uh, I, can't, I can't get a court case and go in and say, I'm going to be the judge, jury, and right, prosecutor, right. and I'm going to represent myself. Right. Because if I did, everybody walks out. Mm -hmm. right? Everybody it, walks out right. spotless. So you're right on that. And, and, and what happens in the communities, different communities, mm -hmm. is, is unfortunately always going to be a factor. I was on a call with um, someone, this was through work, and we were talking about gun violence in the communities, and she actually asked me, um, and I, this was one of our light-skinned cousins, that's what I, I usually, when I say I'm referring to some white, and she said, um, why is it that people in the black and brown communities, why are they so fast to pull the trigger, or why are they so fast to commit so many crimes? And I said to her, I said, you know, People in the communities that you live in, I live in, they commit these crimes as well. The difference is their parents have the money to cover it up, to keep it from reaching the light of day. So that's the only difference, I said, because there are the, the kids in, in Madeira, some of those kids are just as bad as the kids in, you want to say, Price Hill. But you just look at Price Hill and you, you, you just go a different way because evilness or, or, or violentness or, or crime is not, no matter how much people want to do it or, or make it, it is not based on color of skin and it is mm -hmm. not based on your economical situation. The only difference is how much money you have determined how much people will know. Well, it's, it's how the police handle it in these communities. They know that if they uh, handle uh, children, they have to handle children a certain way in Wyoming, in Indian Hill, in Mason, because as you say, the parents have money, and if you, you know, if you take me there, then I am going to respond accordingly. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have a fight on your hands. Whereas if I am in uh, Cincinnati, in some of these other areas, uh, these people are already oppressed. So they don't even have the fight in them or the resources to respond to the injustices that are being perpetrated upon them. Um, and that's that civil rights coming out of no, them. And, and, that's, so, and that's, why, that's why you're here. We need to, thank goodness that's coming out of you. Um, we, needed, we needed to do that. Let me ask, um, just kind of based on, on this part of the conversation mm -hmm. that we said, I, I just kind of get your, your points. Yeah, I mean, I think I would say even at like the lowest level of this Hamilton County Youth Court crime, which is like very petty issues, um, the amount of black Americans and black teenagers that come in for these trials, I would say is double, maybe even triple um, other races. And I've also noticed the crimes committed are almost always like not, you know, like stupid things like, like what I mentioned earlier. So over my three years, I've definitely noticed this trend and I can say firsthand it's true. And I can also say that you know, the policing is much harsher in um, less opportune areas than it would be in somewhere like Mason. And as a young person, yeah. um, how does that make you feel? It definitely makes me, um, okay, like first off, thankful that 
I do live in a community where I don't really have to worry about the police at all. Um, and I don't think I've ever had any bad interactions with the police. But it also makes me think about how um, the question I always ask myself is, if I was in one of these districts um, with you know, harsher police and less opportunities, how would my life be different? And I don't really have an answer for that, but it's just something I have to think about. And I can assume it probably wouldn't be as, I wouldn't be as fortunate as I am now. And I, and I like what you said, the fact of um, being fortunate, right? Um, being fortunate doesn't sound to me like you feel, I'm owed this, you know, this, I'm supposed to be here. It's, it's being fortunate to be in that position. Mm -hmm. And also to give you a different perspective, a different look at what's going on. Yeah. And the fact that there's something within you that says it's not right. I want to do something about it. I want to be involved in change. And I think we need, I'm, I'm always inspired when people say, what inspires you? What makes you feel like you can keep going on? It's when I see young people, when I see young people who are looking at the situation, looking at what's going on, what's not right, what could be right, and then how to fix it. Because the only way, like Attorney Smith can do so much, but mm -hmm. the work is so vast, mm -hmm. you know, you, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to be able to make your marks on what you're doing, but it takes somebody, we need younger people who are willing to come behind and say, I see what you're doing. I want to be a part of it, which is what you did. You reached out. And that also means because you can watch the work that Attorney Smith is doing, you can look into the future yeah. as well. And, and as you're encountering things, you have this wealth to go mm -hmm. back. And when you look at like um, Katanji Brown mm -hmm. um, and how any one of these attorneys, either one of these judges had someone that they connected to that was able to give them guidance that they were able to look at and go back and reference. So I think it's really great that as a young person, you reached out. She didn't reach out to you. I think it's great that you reached out mm -hmm. to her. Mm -hmm. And you said something that was very appealing to her. Could you just share some of that with us? Right. So um, I first um, got in contact with her through the Glenday Smith Youth Sanctuary, which is her nonprofit, which deals with a lot of issues like the ones we discussed. And um, I thought that was really great and something that perfectly aligned with what I wanted to do and the changes I wanted to bring out. So um, I reached out through email mm -hmm. and she was very eager to meet and this has been one of the best opportunities of my life so far. Okay, so I thank you again for, for the work you're doing and um, especially for our young people. Our young people need champions. Listen, I'm not gonna act like there aren't some young people that, um, that are making things worse for a lot of young people because they are. You know, I'm not, I, I understand you're saying it's a civil court, um, and I understand, <laughs> basing on hearing some of this, and, and knowing it from the past, how ridiculous some of the things are that these young people are going through. Mm -hmm. But I also understand that we have some young people that, for whatever reason, when you look at the fact that young people in certain black and brown communities have to see domestic violence, gun violence, homicides, and continue to and, and be expected to continue to function as normal human beings while people who go to the military and actually see um, war efforts i mean war action who come home and they're suffering from ps ps ptsd from what they're seeing but young people aren't expected to go through that so thank you both for the work that you're doing thank you attorney smith for for working with this young man and young man, thank you again for yep. reaching out to her. And, and I pray nothing but the best mm -hmm. for the work that you're doing. And, and whatever, I don't know what your plans are moving forward, but whatever it is, I believe it's going gonna, it's gonna to be powerful yep. and you're going to make a mm -hmm. difference. I hope so. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate the praise. But one thing I do want to say is I think that I'm not really like anything special. I think there's a lot of people like me who have noticed the issues. It's just that many people don't know where they can go about to make things better. So for that, um, I would say definitely reach out to people because I was surprised that she wanted to help me so much, like help me achieve what my goal was, which is bringing about change so much. And um, until you reach out, you never know what sort of connections you can form. You can. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, young man, to give respect or to give honor where honor is due. Right. And so that's what I was giving to you. I was giving you honor for what you're doing. And again, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. Continue it. 
don't get discouraged because it's easy mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. discouraged. Right. Don't do that. And Attorney Smith, thank you again. Again, we could go on. We could go on mm -hmm. and on because there's so much more to talk about. I know we could go on and <laughs> yes, on. And I got so much more I want to dig into this young man and talk about yes. not cases at juvenile court, but that experience. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully one day we'll get you back. It'd be great if we get you back once you once you are our um, judge. Mm -hmm. See, I'm speaking in existence. Absolutely. Once you're, once you're a judge, um, and keep fighting, please keep fighting yes. for young people because I young will. people's need, young, young people's, yeah, see, I told you, we got that same GPA. Young people <laughs> need a champion, and mm -hmm. sometimes they get the worst, the worst of the lot um, mm -hmm. because people just act like they were never young and that they never did things that mm -hmm. was out of whack. So mm -hmm. thank you again. I want to thank you. Listen, everybody, I hope... I, I know today gave you some information. If you're a parent and you have a child that's in the juvenile court system, if you are a neighbor and you keep thinking, wow, this kid has just got to be the worst child on earth, or if you are a school, if you're a school administrator, if you're a teacher, if you're a Cincinnati police officer, if you're a lawyer, if you work in the grocery store, if you have a corner store, whatever it is you do, you we need to think about our young people and we need to switch our paradigm on thinking about them and how do we work with them. We can't mm -hmm. uh, continue mm -hmm. to allow young people to have to face the worst things of our society and then wonder why mm -hmm. they react in the ways that they do. So until the next time, we're together. Get your health insurance. I'm telling you, health insurance is one of the leading causes of bankruptcy. So now you got bankruptcy. You got to wait two years at least before you can get any movement if you do it. And then it's all because you didn't have health insurance. And then you got stuck with some crazy health bills, health and health, medical bills. So let's just do that. So, hey, until the next time we're together.